Hi everyone, this is Don Dixon and welcome to another edition of our master class on the mechanics of fishing. When we're thinking in terms of depth control, rather than just the depth, we need to be thinking in terms of how do we arrive at that depth. And what I mentioned at that time was what he meant was that we need to use our knowledge. Our knowledge of what? People are asking. Our knowledge of what? Well, our knowledge of lake types, our uh, knowledge of species of fish, our knowledge of the seasonal condition, our knowledge of the daily weather and water condition, uh, our knowledge of, of speed control, our knowledge of, of structure types, and, we're, uh, and, and, and our knowledge of the breaks and break lines that we need to be fishing. So all of these different parts, these different segments of our knowledge allows us to eventually arrive at a spot where we can bring a lure by a fish where he is at the right time and fishing in the right manner. That's what he means when he says depth control. So as I tried to explain it, even though it seemed to be a, a bit of a convoluted uh, uh, discussion, even to me, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, I don't know how else to say it except I'm going to go back to that musky tournament for a minute and, and give you an idea of what exactly I'm saying. It wasn't, we didn't win that tournament because we caught a fish at 45 feet. You see, we could have been fishing at 45 feet down near the dam in that extreme clear water. And I can promise you, we would not have caught a fish had we been down there. The weather condition and the clear water would have prohibited any movement to that kind of a depth if we would have been fishing in the dam area, but we weren't in the dam area. And here's why we were not. Because as educated, modern day educated structure fishermen, and our knowledge that's been given to us from Buck Perry, we first analyzed the lake type. It's a highland reservoir. And Buck says, when it's too steep, it's too deep, it's too clear in a highland type reservoir. Move towards the headwaters. So it was that knowledge that sent us on our way up Lindley Creek. We were moving towards the headwaters because we had studied and knew all of the reasons why we were supposed to be doing that. My whole point is this. We could have been fishing somewhere else at 45 feet and never caught fish. But <clears throat> because of our knowledge given to us by Buck Perry, we had moved towards the headwaters and we kept going until we found some better water color. This was one of our considerations. Once we found that water color, then all we had to do was identify some structure in that area, some fishable structure. And so that was our next step and that's what we did. We identified that structure uh, as I explained, you know, the last time we met exactly what that structure was. But once we did a quick map of the bar, and then we started following the drop-off, we came across another situation that's very important in all of our fishing, and we know that because Buck says it's important. It's called a sharper break. And those sharper breaks appear to be a neon sign to the fish, like a flashing sign saying, here I am, here I am, come get me. So when we found that sharper break, we knew we were in business. But not because we're so smart, it's because Buck already told us. And so we found the spot. So now the lake type gave us the information that we needed to move towards the headwaters. That clear water told us you got to go towards the headwaters. We did that. Then we had to locate some structure because after all, structure is our guide as to where the fish are going to be. So we just can't have good water color. We have to have, find some structure, which we did. Once we found that structure, we did a map of it and then interpreted the brakes and the brake lines on that structure so we could identify where we're going to actually fish. And then we had to consider the depths involved. The drop off was 45 feet. So then we had to discover how depth control. And of course, again, because of Buck's information, we knew we could pull out an 800 spoon plug on wire line and troll that spot. 
Now, another question came up, which would I rather do? Uh, should I cast the spot or should I troll it? Well, we decided on trolling because of what Bucks taught us. And that is, a muskie is a, an elongated fish with a long body and they can't just react to a bait like a bass does. As I mentioned, bass can turn on a dime. A muskie cannot do that. What a muskie does is once he feels the lure and he tries to locate it, and all of a sudden he sees it. Once he sees it, because he has to see it in the end. So once he sees it, he swings in behind that bait and follows it for a time until he finally gets a good shot at it and he takes it. So because of our knowledge of a species of fish that we were after, after all it was a musky tournament, we chose trolling over casting. Doesn't mean we couldn't have caught a fish casting, but we knew we had a better chance with a trolled lure. So how are we going to troll at 45 feet? An 800 spoon plug on wire line. So if you analyze, how did we win that tournament? And again, I'm not, I'm not in any way wanting to call attention to me or to Tommy. But when you caught four fish over that horrendous weather condition, over a two day period, where you had 250 other anglers that didn't catch one stinking fish, it's got to tell you something. Maybe what we're doing is the right way to go. I mean, that, that was too coincidental. Now, if there'd have been 20 other fish caught and we had the biggest fish in one, so what? People say, so what? But the fact that they did not catch one fish, 250 guys over two days, they could be beginners. And somebody put a rod in their hands and go around there throwing in the weeds. Somebody you think would have caught a fish, but they did not. So why did we catch it? We caught it because of our knowledge, not because we were at 45 feet, not because we had a spoon plug. We caught those fish because of our knowledge. So over the last few days, I've been getting all these emails. Man, brother, I'm with you. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I, wanna, I want to acquire all this knowledge. But what knowledge are you talking about specifically? Not just a broad uh, uh, you know, category. What specific knowledge do I need in order to be successful? Folks, I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> Buck shared his knowledge with the fishing world back in 1950. And then after all of his clinics and schools and everything he was doing, people were clamoring for him to write it down. So he published a book with the information. And that was in 1965. And after people got a hold of this book and started reading, they were hungry for more. They wanted more details. They wanted more specifics. They wanted that to be, in, in, you know, broadened out even, even in more detail than the green book. So he started working on this advanced material. And at that time, of course, I had started working for him. So I was part of this, getting this uh, advanced material put together. And Buck really didn't have a selfish reason for doing it. He began sharing it with the fishing community. And it wasn't to get rich, I can tell you that. I'm witness to that. But then when they asked for more, he gave them more. And then when they asked for more, he gave them the advanced material, 1994. And I'll tell you how committed he was. When that material was finished, I said to him, I said, we have to let the fishing world know that it exists. And he said, okay, what do you have in mind? I said, I'll tell you what, I've made close friends with Kirk Gowdy. I said, we'll do another show with Kirk Gowdy, but we'll have you on the show. And we will actually do the show promoting this information. Let me tell you just how committed he was to getting this information in your hands and in my hands and everybody's hands. When I set it up with Kurt Gowdy, Kurt was excited about having Buck on a television show, national TV. And he was excited about doing this show with Buck. He had heard all about Buck's earlier uh, campaign back in the, in the 50s, but had never met Buck. So he was excited. So we put it all together. We're going to do this show. We're going to tell people that this material is now available. 
I'll tell you how excited Buck was. To be on national TV was something that he used to be. He started by giving clinics to 50 people a night. Now he's going to be on national TV, on a national network, reaching probably 30 million people. He was so convinced that the fishermen in this country were hungry for this knowledge that he went out personally, and I was there, so I know it to be true. He spent $615,000 to print about 18,000 or so of these advanced material sets. After that show, after about three months, there was only a thousand sets left. We sold 15 or 16,000 sets. Fishermen were hungry. They just needed to know about it. They needed to be informed that there was, in fact, some knowledge out there that if you garnered that yourself and applied it to your fishing, you too could be successful. It's not really all that hard. The only hard part was we never had the information. You know, I got to thinking after I got all of these emails, what knowledge? Buck's knowledge changed my whole life, not just my fishing life, changed my life. Changed how I earned a living for 35 years and had fun. I got to work directly with them. It was terrific. I always say a fishing education second to none. I learned directly out in the boat with the boss, the guy who came up with all this. And I was as anxious for the entire fishing world to get a hold of this as he was. Because I know the difference it makes. It makes all the difference. And one of the things that I want to share with you today, I've gone off a little bit. I know I've got a second example I'm going to tell you about. I may have to postpone that till the next time we talk. But I felt it was important to talk about this. You know, it hit me as I was getting these emails that in every participation sport that I know of, there are heroes. There's, there's a hero that wrote a book or in later years did a video and today did a CD or, or whatever it is. Or today a download off your computer, you get all the instruction you ever needed to have. Every sport that I can think of, they had their mentors, they had their experts. And you could go from football to baseball, you go all up and down the line. The thing that I thought of the most was golf. Now, as many of you know, golf has become huge in this country. Uh, when I was in college, I think the leading money or earner that year in golf earned a hundred thousand. I think I think it was Arnie. I think it was the first time anybody had ever earned that much money in a year. And today, <laughs> you can. If you're on tour, you can finish dead last and make more money than that. I mean, it's totally changed. But back in those days, everybody knew if you were going to start playing golf, and by the way, I did. I played golf a lot, and I practiced a lot, and I read, and I read, and I read. I read the experts, and I can promise you with, today with all of the young guns that are making making uh, the headlines today, I can guarantee you one thing. They all read Ben Hogan's five easy pieces. They all read it. It was the gospel book. The fundamentals of how to make a golf swing. I can guarantee you, even the youngest great golfer out there right now, maybe John Rahm, he's read that book. So it's pretty easy to identify who was who. But because of the nature of that sport, there's always a new generation of heroes coming along. And of course, when I was growing up, it was Arnie and it was uh, Jack Nicholas, and of course, setting all the records and so on and so forth. And, and uh, these guys started to be recognized as the greatest golfers of all time. By the way, before I even leave this, guess who used to call Buck all the time with, their, with his fishing questions? Bobby Jones. So we have a connection with golf in a lot of different ways. But at any rate, uh, all of a sudden, now people started thinking of these are the experts, but they still read Ben Hogan's book. Or if you were from Texas, you probably read Harvey Pettick. You read his book, and I read it too. And as an avid golfer, I realized that all of a sudden these other heroes are coming along. They're the ones that people are going to be listening to. 
And sooner or later, Ben Hogan stuff is going to be sort of passe. And to some degree, it has happened. But I attribute most of that to the, the significant changes in gear and so on and so forth, all, all of the new stuff that's being produced and the, the difference in the golf ball and, and uh, all, all of the above. Uh, but I do know that when Tiger came along, he set a whole new standard. So now anybody, the only people that, that were playing golf, all they listened to was what Tiger Woods was doing and what he was saying. But I can promise you, Tiger read Ben Hogan's book. And after Tiger, all of these new young guns that are having all the success, and rightfully so, these guys are terrific golfers, and they're fun to watch. I mean, really fun to watch. And I'm sort of an expert from the sideline because at age 14, I actually won the Pittsburgh Junior Amateur at age 14, and I shot a par around that day to do it from the tips, from the back tees. So I was a pretty accomplished golfer and then I had a bad car accident, but in college, I did make the college team. And so I've been playing all my life and, and until three years ago when I had a rotator cup, I was still a three handicap. I was still playing fairly good golf. So I'm a bit of a, at least an arm's length, knowledgeable guy about golf. and. As I recall all of this background in the golf and so on and so forth, I see that there is a connection. Golf has its heroes. They also have the experts that laid down the groundwork, the fundamentals for success. So if you want to be a better golfer, you got to do some reading. You got to read, in my, in my opinion, you got to read Ben Hogan. That's, that's where you start. Uh, and you got to put in some study if you want to be good. But here's what hit me the other day. It's one thing to talk about, okay, there's an expert in fishing too. But instead of it being generational where every 10 years or every decade or something, some new stars come along, some new heroes come along and say something different and make some, some different discoveries that has never been talked about before. That has not happened, my friends, in fishing. It has never happened. I can tell you in the, in the 50 years I've been involved, there is nothing of significance that has ever been said about successful fishing in the last 50 years that Buck hasn't already said. Sometimes somebody will take what Buck says and they'll revisit it, put a different name to it and call it something else to try to make their own name, you know, jump up into the headlights. Jump up into the headlines. But I can promise you, nothing new has ever been said since I've been in the game. That's 50 years. There's only one expert who made all the discoveries. So people say, what knowledge do I need? This is what you need. Now, I'm going to say something out right here, too, that's really, really important. We can't just read it. So many people read it. They get the material. They read it. They, they're aware of it but they never experience it. They can maybe quote, you know, every word that's in here. They can tell you all about it, but they've never done it. It's like golf. And I'm using this analogy because I think it fits. You can read Ben Hogan. You read Harvey Pennick, a couple of my favorite guys that, you know, growing up that I, that I listened to. You can study all of the videos that ever been made by some of the latest heroes. You can try to copy hitting a driver like Dustin Johnson, but please, <laughs> they're not going to be too many going to do that, be able to do that. However, my point is this, you can read all about it, like guys selling the newspapers, you know, extra, extra, read all about it. But if you never go to that practice range, guess what? You'll never be a good golfer. You'll never develop that swing unless you go out there and do it. And you got to keep doing it and doing it and doing it with the hopes of maybe becoming a good golfer. And if you want to become a good fisherman, yeah, you need to read it. You need to study the right, and I, I preface, the right information. The information that's been not only 
discovered by Buck, but proven by Buck through all of his research, going all over North America, fishing all different types of water and all different weather and water conditions to prove that his theory about deep water being the home of the fish was true. And so there's science behind everything he ever wrote down. He never wrote down anything that wasn't a fact. And I can verify it because I've experienced everything that's in this material. He forced me to experience it all. And that's another thing that hit me. He didn't even uh, uh, allow us to begin that on the water schooling, which he really, it was, he was passionate about it. He wanted to do it. He wanted to be able to teach guys on the water. But he wasn't going to allow me to do it until I, to in his opinion, I have seen everything I ever needed to see. Every different type of lake, every different type of natural lake, every type of reservoir, every river, tidal basin, sloughs, all of the above. Six years I spent with my apprenticeship before he said, okay, we're going to do an on water school, which is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And then we started. So I started thinking, yeah, everybody wants to catch a fish. They want the end result. Everybody wants to shoot a par round of golf, but they're not willing to go out there and hit a thousand balls at the practice range four or five days a week to be able to shoot a par round of golf. They're not willing to put in the time. They read about how to do it, but they haven't actually gone out to do it. So I can tell you, the information's available. Buck used to say, Knowledge is the key to fishing success, but we have the knowledge now. We have it. And we're willing to share it. He's willing to share it. You know, you can buy his lifetime of knowledge for $69. And I quit telling people about it because I don't want to sound like I'm trying to sell books. But if you want to learn how to catch a fish, and you want to learn how to be successful and catch four fish when 250 other people on your lake never caught the first fish, you need to have this information. But then you need to go out and apply it and practice it over and over and over in different types of water at different times of year under different weather and water conditions for different species. And once you do that, guess what? I can promise you on the worst days, on the absolute worst days, let me back up for a second, weather and water conditions control all activity of the fish. And a great example was that muskie tournament. That was the worst weather condition I could have ever been involved with when I needed to go fishing. It was the worst. But even under the worst condition, if you do what Buck tells you to do, even when nobody else catches fish, you will. So until the next time, thanks for being with me today. I appreciate you. And oh, by the way, follow us on Facebook and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again. See you the next time.